on internationalism in the crisis hosted by Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas and supported by a number of groups, including the Stop the War Coalition. May Day is the most of all celebrated internationalism and unity. And this event could be more timely as we face Trump and Trumpism in the midst of the current pandemic. And all around the world, governments, including our own, are still putting resources into weapons of mass destruction rather than health and investing in our future. Due to an amazing level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we are streaming live from the Arise YouTube page as the event goes on. Please post questions um, or comments below the stream, although we have actually added a, a fantastic international speaker, so we can't be clear as to whether or not we'll be able to get to them. And um, We'll, we'll attempt to make this, uh, uh, to put this to the panel at the end. Uh, we've got a whole list of amazing speakers and they'll be telling us why we should build our world based on cooperation and end sanctions, debt and war. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna start quickly with our first speaker so that we can get everybody in and that'll be Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Okay, thanks very much, Belle, and uh, solidarity and greetings to everybody on this May Day, which is probably one of the most important times for us to communicate and to get together on an international basis for a May Day. We know the terrible situation that humanity is facing as a result of the pandemic. And we know, for example, in this country, there are now, according to the Financial Times, an estimated more than 46,000 deaths, which is more than the number of people who died in the London Blitz. If you look at the United States, uh, they went through the 58,000 uh, deaths only the other day. That puts the deaths from coronavirus in the United States higher than the number of US casualties who died during the Vietnam War, which took place over decades. So we have a very, very serious situation facing us. And I think it's particularly serious because if you look at the governments, the most neoliberal governments, the governments which have been most aggressive about cutting healthcare, who've been most determined to keep us on this free market path, have been the United States uh, under Donald Trump, uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil, uh, where he's repeatedly ignored any notion that the, uh, that the virus uh, can affect people in Brazil with, with disastrous consequences. And of course here um, in Britain with um, Boris Johnson's government, which has repeatedly failed to take the measures necessary in terms of PPE, in terms of testing, um, in being very slow over the lockdown. So I think all of these issues are major issues facing us. And when we look at what we want internationalism to mean, in this period of, uh, of lockdown and of coronavirus and the very big threats that we've faced, it seems to me that it is grotesque that we have uh, a call for a ceasefire from the United Nations, quite rightly, uh, that the wars that are going on around the world should cease and that we should concentrate the resources of the world in dealing with this uh, pandemic. We have only this week um, in the war in Yemen, uh, Saudi Arabia has launched 200 um, airstrikes in this week alone. Uh, we know that uh, the ceasefire isn't a reality. It isn't backed by a whole number of, of governments. We know that sanctions are having a huge impact on particular countries, particularly uh, Iran, which has a high level of, of coronavirus outbreaks, shortages of medicine, of food, of all those things make a very big difference. And of course, in Venezuela. So these are all issues for us. And of course, the continuation of arms sales. What kind of a world is it that we are struggling to get masks for people? We're struggling to get the very basics to protect our key workers and the population as a whole. And at the same time, there are deals still being done selling arms to countries and a huge increase in armaments and on military spending over the last year or so. So these are all, I think, very, very big questions for us and ones that we need to, uh, ones that we need to address. I also think that this is a time when the rulers of the world who should be um, looking to cooperation, should be looking to solutions, should be looking to ways of not making working people and the poor pay for this crisis, that 
Instead, we have various governments where people will be doing the opposite and where they will use the cover of the crisis to try to, uh, to uh, get their, uh, their position through. Um, we saw this week that the Palestinians, that the coalition deal in Israel is moving closer towards annexation of the Palestinian West Bank. And that will mean terrible, uh, even worse situation for the Palestinians. And I feel that Palestine solidarity has to be a very important part of this, not just because the virus is affecting Gaza and the West Bank, but also because we can't forget this question of solidarity. We can't um, allow accusations that we're not allowed to criticize Israel because this might be seen as anti-Semitic to stop us from showing our solidarity with the Palestinian people. I also feel that we have to look at what is happening with foreign policy in this country. And I worry in particular that just this week when Lisa Nandy, who's now the um, uh, shadow foreign secretary has been saying that maybe we should have more humanitarian interventions like Tony Blair's, which I feel we need really uh, like a hole in the head. This is the same week that Keir Starmer has now said that um, he wants to, uh, he, he is abandoning the position, which is to support the, um, the UN position on Kashmir and ending the occupation of Kashmir. So I think these are real and big questions. I'm very, very pleased to be part of the discussion today. And I know we're going to hear a lot of very different experiences and different views about what this means, but internationalism has to be at the heart of socialist politics. It has to be central to what we do and international solidarity. The idea that we don't have empires, that we don't have imperialism, we don't have um, governments which are trying to um, continue with wars and militarism in this time is absolutely crucial to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Apsana Begum, um, another new MP like me, uh, the Labour Member of Parliament for Poplar and Limehouse. Apsana? Thank you, Belle, and uh, solidarity and May Day greetings to everyone. Um, I want to begin sort of talking about the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which obviously has caused mm -hmm. immense human suffering, um, devastated national economies and wreaked uh, havoc um, in the lives of everyone um, around the world. And as the pandemic has spread, it's become uh, sort of increasingly clear uh, that the coronavirus crisis demands a global plan of action, which we're yet to see in full. Um, and we know um, that the virus doesn't recognise national borders and neither should our capacity for compassion and care uh, for our human being, um, for our fellow human beings um, um, also uh, do that. Uh, we are learning through the crisis the extent of our interdependence. So, you know, if somebody on the other side of the world gets sick, that can make any of us sick. And this is what the crisis has unfortunately uh, shown us. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, debt um, as well. Um, it's really important that we continue to call uh, for the UK and international community to provide urgent support to the world's poorest countries, including taking a stand against um, unfair international debts, especially as the global south still continues to um, overcome the destruction caused by imperialism um, and also disproportionately shoulder the burden of a uh, global climate crisis that they didn't create. Um, we're seeing, obviously, um, the uh, US sanctions that are hampering Iran's response to COVID-19, um, who are actually calling for relief from these, um, as well as uh, humanitarian aid. Um, and the inability of um, Iranians to access vital medical supplies puts not just people in that country at risk, but inevitably the rest of us too. Um, and I really believe that um, President Trump's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal was an act of di diplomatic sabotage, essentially. And I completely disagree with the uh, reimposition of associated um, uh, US sanctions. And it's really, really clear that all of this is ha having a significant um, economic and social impact. Um, I also wanted to sort of mention uh, the, the, the issues around climate justice. I'm a generation that's grown up with the threat of climate change uh, which has not only become more uh, visible in, in recent uh, months and, and days um, following the tragic fires in Australia and uh, floods in Indonesia. Uh, we know that climate change is rife with injustices um, and diaspora communities um, understand the devastating impact of climate change on our families' livelihoods in countries such as uh, Bangladesh, 
um, and we really have to um, move beyond um, environmental racism towards a climate revolution, I'd say, for everyone. Um, and on that, I, I also wanted to kind of mention that I think, um, you know, on internationalism, it, you know, our internationalism really must acknowledge uh, the role of British um, colonial injustices and the sort of inal inalienable nature of our, our universal human rights. And we know, um, you know, human rights should have no borders and or, or boundaries. It's there in, in the very phrase itself, you know, um, they're, they're there for all humans. Um, and that's why I really share a, a growing concern over the failure to uh, stop Israel's violation of international human rights law. Um, you know, the random uh, um, arrest without, without trial of civilians, um, including children, um, the harassment and humiliation of Palestinians as they go about their everyday life um, are obviously just some of the examples of the human rights violations uh, that are fueling conflict. Um, the, the ongoing torture, rape, um, extrajudicial uh, execution and illegal detention uh, that also continues to take place in Kashmir, uh, which you know, Lindsay kind of mentioned in, in a context as well, are widely documented um, by lots of human rights um, organizations. Um, and, you know, we look at other, what's happening in other countries as well. I mean, you know, so many of us were utterly appalled at the scenes um, just a few months ago in Delhi, uh, where, you know, mobs set fire to mosques and businesses um, and invaded um, the homes of Muslims. Um, and it's no coincidence uh, that the latest uh, violent violence broke out during uh, Donald Trump's visit to India. Um, and this sort of close relationship between Donald Trump um, and Modi was evidence in September last year um, in Houston, Texas, when Modi kind of addressed, you know, a really packed crowd of, of Indian Americans in the presence of Donald Trump, accompanied by a Republican um, governors of different states as well. Um, because that really at the crux of Modi's agenda of providing rule is oppressive, uh, you know, it is essentially oppressive economic, economic policies. Um, in light of what's happening in India, which is, you know, the severe economic crisis, rising in unemployment, um, inflation, um, and brutal privatization. And we've got to see what's happening in, in India as a country as well to see, um, you know, the, this agenda of uh, divide and rule. Um, but of course, you know, we also have to look our, at our role um, mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got um, we, we've got to look at our historic role in nurturing and fostering conflicts around the world. Um, and, you know, the the tactics by Modi and Trump's, um, unfortunately, are not new. Um, I'm being told that I think um, we've got uh, kind of going over um, the time allocated to me. So I will kind of um, sort of conclude um, and say that in my constituency um, in Pop Brown Limehouse, uh, we really know that um, we really must never embark again on illegal wars, imperialism and destruction, um, but adopt, make sure we adopt a progressive outward looking global view um, driven by social justice, solidarity and human rights. And it's in that spirit that, um, that we should continue. And I'm gonna stop there and allow others to contribute um, as well. Thank you, Absana. Thank you. Uh, before we go on to our next speaker, uh, we have a message of solidarity from a comrade in India. Um, the task before the working class in all countries today is not to allow capital to get in, get away with the crisis caused by the coronavirus, but to build another world that is free from war, want and injustice. Our world of equality, fairness and democracy can only be built through unity and solidarity. This May Day, amidst the pandemic, the Indian and British working class resolving to do this together will be a powerful symbol. And that's from Gautam Modi, the General Secretary of the New Trade Union Initiative in India. We're going to head on to our next speaker, um, who is Mark Weisbrook, who is a US economist and co-founder of Just Foreign Policy. Mark? No. Is Mark on the call? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we're having some technical difficulties with Mark. I'm gonna go on to our next speaker and come back to Mark next. And that's uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, who is from Argentina and the International Transport Workers Federation. Hello, good afternoon to all. Can you hear me well? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a trade unionist uh, since I was very young in my first years as a 
uh, shop steward uh, in Argentina. And uh, so I'm very proud and doubly proud today to share May Day, May Day greetings to all, uh, with all of you um, to, to discuss how internationalism has responded and how unions from the international perspective, because I, I am part of the leadership of the International Transport Workers Federation and transport workers have been in the front line of uh, the confrontation to the virus and the resistance to the virus. So, um, but I, I would like to uh, go into uh, the responses that uh, two governments in Latin America have uh, had uh, lately, uh, because that will show us uh, which, are, which is the, the way possible to, the best way possible to confront um, this crisis. And uh, you can see the big differences between, in the approach between Brazil and Argentina in Latin America. And as, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, uh, Bolsonaro has, been, has had a very particular approach since the beginning in Brazil. Um, he started saying that this is just a small flu. And the day before yesterday, he was asked uh, when, when Brazil was having more deaths than China and Spain and Italy, he was asked um, what was his view? And he said, so what, uh, I'm sorry. And he mentioned that his second name is Messiah, but he doesn't uh, perform miracles. Um, so that's the approach of uh, that government in particular. The provincial governments, the state governments in Brazil have been taking some measures to confront uh, the virus, but uh, uh, that was against the national policy and against the national precedent that went against them and went against the workers. Um, they gave what the what Bolsonaro did is gave more power to the employers uh, to deal however they want with the workers without the need, uh, as it is in the law, of negotiating with the unions. So he neglected uh, the unions. On the other side, you have uh, Argentina who reacted. Uh, the government of Fernandez uh, reacted since the first day. And uh, they brought together experts, but they also brought together the unions to discuss which were the best ways of confronting uh, the pandemic uh, over there. So uh, uh, President Fernandez was very clear that he needed and he wanted to prioritize public health um, and then think of the uh, on the economy. The thing is that it's it's also and, and this is in spite of the big problem with the debt that Argentina is. So it's not a country that has uh, plenty of uh, US dollars reserved there uh, to, to expand. It's all the contrary. The neoliberal government of Macri that ended last year uh, left uh, the country in, in a very poor uh, state uh, towards the IMF and towards other creditors. And so apart from dealing with the pandemic, uh, this government needs to deal with that debt. Um, so it's a double effort for Argentinians, but nevertheless, they are discussing with the unions, they are confronting the pandemic altogether and having good results so far. Uh, if you see um, the, the virus started spreading in Brazil and Argentina at the same time, and Argentina has only 200 deaths uh, so far. So, um, and, and also it proves another thing, this, uh, um, confronting positions of it's the economy or uh, fighting against the virus. If you don't fight against the virus, your economy goes uh, down the drain all the same. And it's the best proof of uh, Brazil. Brazil started neglecting uh, and is having economic, uh, serious economic problems as well. It's not going to grow, of course, as, ex as expected. Um, the thing is that uh, what you lose on the way is lives. And that's a big difference. And that is where the unions have been trying to uh, cooperate and collaborate uh, with, uh, with the governments uh, that have been keen to discuss with them. Uh, in spite of the dif difficulties, there are uh, workers that are in the forefront and are uh, risking their lives because maybe they're not having uh, the right equipment or the protective equipment. And nevertheless, particularly uh, health workers, but also transport workers that are essential for, even though there are not passengers coming and going, are essential for cargo transport. So this is uh, 
um, I'm very proud to say that uh, uh, there are workers that are heroes. And today, May Day, it's a good way of celebrating May Day, recognizing those workers that are risking and making a big effort to confront this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thanks, okay, um, we have, thank you. We have now uh, got Mark back. So we're, we're going to ask Mark Weisbrook, who is a US economist and co-founder of the Just Foreign Policy to speak. Mark? Thank you, thank you very much. And it's great to be here with everyone uh, in a group like this. I wanted to just uh, say something about uh, something that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but I think it's important. Sometimes we have to, you know, in a crisis like this, uh, take advantage of the things that are available, the kind of low hanging fruit. And uh, one of them right now is that the IMF, uh, the managing director even of the IMF, but also all the European leaders and people who are not normally on our side on, on all these things we're talking about, uh, have proposed the creation of hundreds of billions and possibly trillions of dollars worth of IMF uh, currency called special drawing rights. And this is very uh, important because it's a kind of quantitative easing at the international level, even though there is no world currency and there is no world central bank, the IMF actually has its own kind of virtual uh, currency and it is exchangeable for dollars by all the 189 member uh, countries. So this was actually done in 2009. Uh, they created about $287 billion worth and, and gave it to all countries in the world. That's how it works. Unfortunately, most of it goes to the countries that don't need it, the high income countries, but that, that doesn't really matter so much because they just don't use it. And uh, for countries in Africa, for example, in the poorest countries, who got a small fraction of it, it made an enormous difference. You know, in Ethiopia, multiplied their central bank reserves by 800% during the world recession. So we have this terrible uh, debt crisis, other people have mentioned, uh, and we have, um, you know, obviously there's a, uh, a terrible world recession. There's, and then the coronavirus is spreading. And if you look at the numbers of people who could get uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's potentially in the millions and it depends on what governments do. So if they get this money, uh, it could make a very large difference. And again, you have the managing director of the IMF now. She's on March 27th, she spoke in favor of it. She said that the financing needs of developing countries are 2.5 uh, trillion, uh, dollars and uh and she spoke a couple times on it until the u.s treasury department basically uh told her not to and uh and then that's what happened now this is what we were talking you know other people were talking about they this is the terrible imperialism of the control of these institutions the u.s treasury department says no and the answer becomes no and you can't have it this time and but there's pushback on this uh, and uh, so, and there's pushback here in the United States. You have, uh, you know, a number of members of Congress have proposed legislation to reverse the Treasury Department's decision. But I, I'm bringing this up uh, because obviously all countries have a, 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 all governments have a voice here, and everybody in the world is for this. Uh, and all kinds of former heads of state, again, uh, not people who are on our side on these issues usually, have said they want it just because. You know they have their own reasons, right? I mean, there are financial uh, big financial firms who would rather see uh, most of the world come out of recession than uh, collapse and have balance of payments crises and debt defaults. And so, for all these various reasons, everybody is for it. Now, I, I bring this up because I think it's really important. It's something that's right there, and it could be one, and it could make a difference of hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of lives in the world. You know, some of you have seen the Imperial College of London report said that, uh, you know, the difference between governments doing something, doing the things they're supposed to do around uh, the uh, COVID-19 and not doing anything could, is, is their estimate was 37 million lives. 
And uh, so this is very uh, important. And again, I bring it up because I think we sometimes don't pay enough attention to these things that are, are right now uh, can, can make a difference, even though they don't, uh, you know, they're not going to change uh, this, uh, you know, this system of control and the system of terrible injustice, whereby uh, the so much of the world is facing default, and all the, uh, you know, all the economic catastrophes that uh, can come with this, this, this whole, uh, both public health and economic crisis. So I'm bringing that up. And, you know, this made a difference even in the Great Recession, you know, Europe, was uh, when Europe finally engaged in quantitative easing and the Bank of uh, England as well, it made, it made a significant difference. It was a major change in policy. And uh, so this is something at the international level that is being fought over right now. It's barely getting any media. It's there if you look for it, uh, but it's barely getting any press. And it's one of the biggest possible immediate things that we could actually win. I don't Thank know how much you, time I, I just stopped there because I, I didn't want to take more than you. <laughs> no, actually, everyone, um, just, just uh, you know, um, a, bit, a bit of praise to the speakers that have gone before and an example to the ones that are coming afterwards. You've kept perfectly to time. Well done. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, just to say, it's amazing to see that we have over 1,000 people uh, tuned in, including on YouTube. Um, so so that's, that's, that's been great. I mean, it is a very, very difficult um, way to, to, to hold a rally, not something that we've done before, uh, but it's fantastic that regardless of the lockdown, we are able to still join together in solidarity with the miracle, um, sometimes the curse of Zoom. Uh, we're gonna go on to our next speaker, uh, who is actually in, in Accra, um, Jechi Tano of the Third World Network. Jechi, are you, are you on the line? To be able to solidarity with one another. The conditions that working people are facing across the world are conditions which are, are not unknown to people in Africa. We see the deaths that uh, Lindsay and others have referred to, tens of thousands of people, preventable deaths happening in places like Britain. We see thousands of workers, frontline essential workers, imperiled by, by this process and being victims of some of the cutbacks that have taken place over decades. And in Africa, we also see some of these things also happening. So much so that it's difficult sometimes to differentiate between the nightmare scenario of a pandemic and the nightmare of everyday routine existence. There are people who have no water, who have no sanitation, who have no homes that they can stay in. They have no uh, uh, the, the means to, 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 to practice the physical distancing and the most basic requirements of survival that, that uh, you know, uh, can enable them to see through the, this, this uh, uh, crisis. At the same time, we see that global capital is still, you know, exercising its predatory, profit, proprietary gouging uh, uh, within Africa itself. Pharmaceutical companies, which are behind the curb in terms of assisting people to survive this, uh, are exercising monopoly pricing in Africa. We see that uh, food import prices are going through the roof. We see that uh, financial speculators are running away from uh, the, the uh, uh, domestic debts that they have bought into and leaving countries, whole economies and, uh, and currencies uh, uh, vulnerable. We see mining companies, telecoms companies, uh, you know, uh, uh, digital financial companies, international transport companies, either seeking to ensure that everything becomes a gravy train or that they abandon it and, be, and it becomes a graveyard. And from those points of view, I think that when we, when we think in terms of the necessity of, of actually not simply survival, but actually banding together in, in greater unity to confront this than some of the things that have been said about immediate, uh, um, the, the immediate responses like Mark talked about in the SDRs must be immediately combined with longer term, more systemic responses as well. The, in the case of the special drawing rights, for example, they ought to be guided increasingly by an affirmative, redis, uh, affirmative action, redistributive uh, 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 policy, which ensures that a minimum basket of goods of services, of incomes, of welfare, welfare support, and uh, are, are, are the basis on which those calculations are made and allocations are made 
to uh, 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 individual countries and are allocated in terms of uh, you know, government expenditure, public investment, and so on and so forth. We do not want a return to a situation where these pile up in terms of reserves, which, become, which inject more liquidity into a, global, a speculative global financial system. We do not want it to you know, uh, uh, buttress a new financial system where remittances for uh, Africans, which are received by their brothers and sisters, their comrades in the diaspora, become the, 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 the target of speculative fees and high charges, predatory fees by uh, uh, financial companies. We do not want to see a return to, to the fact that governments willy-nilly have to assure credit rating agencies of their responsibilities and therefore sit on you know, uh, investable resources, squeeze uh, public expenditures and so on. We do not want to see a return to the kind of exploitation that we're seeing today in the internationalization, sorry, sorry, the globalization of public financial uh, uh, PFI schemes in uh, critical infrastructure, including today, here and now, critical infrastructure that is needed to, in, in terms of establishing, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the minimum requirements of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, um, you know, th therapy, of isolation, uh, and so on, the public health initiatives that are taking place uh, here as well. So on that basis, I think that the, the, uh, an event like this, which seeks to unite people, whether in employment or out of employment, which seeks to unite those in the formal sector or those in the informal sector, which seeks to unite urban workers with rural workers, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of working people requires us to upgrade and step up the kind of political perspective that we bring. It requires us to ensure that when we think in terms of the ranks of labor, we begin to think more expansively, more creatively. It requires us to be more ambitious about the political resolve that we need and the vision that we need not simply to confront this uh, crisis together, but to overcome uh, this crisis and begin to lay the foundations to building a better world, world and reversing the, the stark inequalities that we're seeing visiting ordinary people in uh, the length and breadth of, of the globe today. And also in, 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 places like, in, in, in places like Africa, where we see a growth model, which actually depends on destruction, the exploitation and destruction of natural resources. And therefore the crossover between animal life and human habitats, the very virus, that the very problem that is at the, at the heart and basis of this virus in terms of the transmission between animals and so on, is built into the daily growth mechanisms with, uh, in, in, uh, in Africa itself, whether it's in terms of deforestation, whether it's in terms of urban pollution, because oil companies like BP or Trafigura are allowed not simply to drill for oil and the, uh, with, with, the, with the looser environmental regulations, but they are allowed to sell imported oil uh, 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 energy products you know, uh, on, the, on the basis of a far lesser, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 far lesser environmental standards than anybody else. Trafigura, for example, sells petroleum and diesel products in Africa. It has a special uh, a product that it sells in Africa, which has about three to four or 5,000 times the levels of, of, of pollutants that will be allowed to be sold in places like Britain, for example. Our lives are no cheaper than anyone else. And if we allow these gradations and these inequalities, these horizontal inequalities to emerge, if we allow, we do not build the politics that can respond to it, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fundamentally. That is when the despair of racism, that is when the despair of populist nationalism becomes some kind of, uh, it seems to be a, a, an attractive option for ordinary people and for working people to, to begin to, 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 to follow. The fact that we have a global, uh, 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 you know, uh, we have a global uh, free trade system means that workers increasingly are competing with one another anyway. If you have a part of the world, whether that without, with or without direct migration, if you have a part of the world where people are paid below the value of the capacity to survive, if, if women are bearing costs which allow, prevent them from having the minimum de 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 decent life, all of us are pulled down together. The spirit of us is degraded, is devalued, is dehumanized. That is precisely why we ought to stand up today, call for a new internationalism, then the new solidarities, which is anti-capitalist, which is anti-racist, which builds in terms of the liberation of women, which actually ensures that the new uh, fresh forces of labor, which is the majority in the world today, in every part of the world today, begins to go on the ascendancy and begins to shape uh, a life uh, and, and, and the conditions of, of, of existence to our favor, in our image, and in, in terms of our highest and best aspirations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jechi. Um, now, we're going on from Accra to Hackney. Equally, a lot of Ghanaians there, obviously not as much. <laughs> um, we're going to hear from a Diane Abbott MP, who was the Labour Member of Parliament for Hackney, North and Stoke Newington.
Hello. Hello. Hi, Diane. Hi. Uh, your your camera's just gone off as well, but you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm really pleased to say a few words about the significance of international in the current times. What Canova, the coronavirus pandemic has shown, even to people who've resisted the idea, that we really are a global community. If some people are stricken with the pandemic, others in other countries will do be, will, will also be. And the way to fight the pandemic will be as united countries working internationally and cooperating internationally. What um, Donald Trump has done with that very foolish anti-Chinese narrative, is not just silly, but it actually detracts from the international struggle. The other thing we found during the coronavirus pandemic is how the fact that we are an international community right here in Britain, the fact that we have a large population of migrants actually makes us stronger. Ever since I've been in politics, people have often tended to speak about immigration and to speak about migrants as if they're a challenge. But we've seen throughout this coronavirus pandemic, migrants and the children of migrants right here in Britain, giving their lives to this country, for this country, and proving, as if anybody wanted it proved, that migrants are a plus migrants are, make an invaluable contribution. And in the face of the global pandemic, they have made perhaps the most vital contribution anybody could wish for. But I also want to talk about the range of immigration issues. And I want to talk about migrants and refugees because sometimes people talk about international issues, but their internationalism doesn't take in migration and refugees. We will undoubtedly see in the coming period a rise in the refugee population. And just as our socialism is nothing without our internationalism, our internationalism is nothing about our concern for migrants and refugees. So faced with the coronavirus pandemic, we learn if we didn't know before that we are one people that we're only as strong as each other, whether you're in China, the United States or London. Faced with the coronavirus pandemic, we learn about the huge contribution that migrants have made and continuing to make to this country. And it's important to remember that refugees and asylum seekers are, should be part of our concern as people who are international in our outlook. Finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Sorry, that's, that, that's one of the difficult things on this Zoom call. Um, thank you very much. We are now going to go to our final speaker um, who has been putting all of these amazing uh, events together for May Day uh, virtually for us. And that's Jeremy Corbyn MP, the Labour Member of Parliament for Islington North. Jeremy, are you on the line? Hi, Bell. Hi, Bell. Hi. Lovely, lovely to see you and welcome to all the thousand and plus people that have come on this call today. A huge thank you to all those that have put it together and organised it. And we've had speakers from three continents already. And I think it's fantastic that we've got this genuinely international coming together. So my May Day greetings to everybody. And we should remember that May Day 
grew originally as a festival of the celebration of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, but it also grew as a festival of resistance um, around the world to oppression, particularly those that were murdered in Chicago, who were trying to organize trade unions in the latter part of the 19th century. So it is a festival of solidarity all around the world and my greetings to people all around the world. It's a time to remember how our rights were won, how the right to elect people was won, how human rights were won, how rights to join a trade union were won in some parts of the world. So it is a time of solidarity with those that are absolutely struggling at the present time, struggling under oppression, struggling under economic hardship and struggling just for the right to be a trade unionist and the right to organize at the workplace. So we send our solidarity to them and understand that global inequality is at one level a north-south inequality, at another level is a gender inequality between women and men, is another level is an ethnic inequality, but is also an inequality within societies, both in the richest and the poorest parts of the world. Diane was absolutely right to mention the issues facing refugees around the world. There are now 65 million people around the world who basically are either internally displaced or refugees from their own country. So spare a thought and think of the Rohingya people from Myanmar who are in refugee camps in Bangladesh or going into India trying to survive. Think of all those people in refugee camps in Jordan, in Libya, in Lebanon, who are trying to survive. They're all people who want to make their contribution to our world. And so when the Western media complain about the numbers of refugees, they should think of the huge numbers of refugees that often go from one war-torn country into a neighboring country that itself may also be war-torn, but will also have difficulty in supporting those people. And also think of those that um, are also in long-term refugee camps, such as the Palestinian people, people from Kashmir, or those that are suffering under conflict, such as in Yemen at the present time, and heed the call of the UN Secretary General for a global ceasefire as, as part of our contribution to dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. So let's make this a day when we recognize injustice and inequality around the world and call for a longer term peace. This week should have been the week in which the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference took place in New York. It obviously isn't taking place because of coronavirus. It will take place, I believe, sometime next year. That conference needs to succeed so that we do eventually get a world free of nuclear weapons and a world that goes in the direction of peace rather than rearmament and war. Gabriel spoke earlier about the effect of neoliberal economics on uh, on Argentina. And uh, Jay Chi spoke about the effect of neoliberal economics on his country and in Africa as a whole. So we should spare a thought for those today that are in prison who have tried to lead governments that have a opposed neoliberal economics and sought to redistribute wealth, often in the teeth of well-funded opposition from essentially global corporations. So think of former President Lula, who is um, still facing trial in Brazil. Think of the former president of Ecuador and think of those in Bolivia that are going through such difficulties at the present time. I think there are two immediate and huge issues that face the world. The first is global climate change and the environmental crisis. I led my party in the last general election and one of the fundamental messages from our party was that we have to deal with the environment crisis, not by panic, not by fear, but by investment for the future in green eco economics, in a sustainable world where we recognize the interdependability of human life with the natural world, and that we develop a green industrial revolution. And this message is strong in this country, it's strong across Europe, and it's very strong in the United States. And we work with all those people to try to bring about environmental justice. 
for all the horrors of COVID-19, and there are horrors, there are hundreds of thousands of deaths as a result. There are hundreds of thousands of people who are suffering grievously because of COVID-19. One other side of it has been, for the first time, because of the lockdown, people have breathed clean air in some cities around the world. And so when COVID-19 is over, let's not return to the economics and politics and environmental policies of the past, but do something very, very different. COVID-19 comes from a mutated virus. It has spread all around the world and it shows our interdependability and need to support each other. The World Health Organization, now so abominably being criticized by the United States administration and some others, warned the world of the danger of COVID-19. Some governments, my own included, didn't take sufficient heed of those warnings. Some went down the road of the rather strange science of herd immunity, uh, which is completely wrong and instead didn't take the necessary steps for testing, for personal protective equipment, and for isolation in order to bring about safety and save lives. But what has come out of this has been an understanding that 10 years of austerity in my country left our health service with only 94% with 94 bed occupancy in our National Health Service hospitals, left more than a million people, mainly older people, waiting for, the, for social care. And it's only the incredible sacrifices and hard work, particularly of BAME people, black and minority ethnic people working in our health and care services, who've also died as a result of this, that have got us through and ensured our hospitals have managed to cope just about with this crisis. So when we come out of this crisis, let's not forget those that gave their all for this. Let's not return to the economics of austerity of the past 10 years that brought about the injustices and inequalities within our society and recognize it's the poorest in the most polluted cities in the world that have often suffered the most as a result of this. So post COVID, a sense of internationalism has got to be the only way forward, a sense that of internationalism and justice. And so in this strange May Day, where we can't speak at rallies and festivals and music and enjoy it in the way that we normally do, we can share wonderful things on our phones, on our computers. I received a wonderful message this morning of the Internationale being sung by a group of people in Spanish speaking countries all over the world, absolutely wonderful. It's that sort of spirit of the enterprise of working class communities all around the world that we should celebrate today and be together as a socialist movement, be together as a labor movement, be together as an environmental movement, be together as people fighting for justice and rights and support each other. That surely has to be the message of May Day. Thank you very much for inviting me on the call today. Happy May Day, everyone. Can't hear her. Unconventional May Day rally. What it has given us the opportunity to do is to connect with comrades from all across the world, which has been amazing. And thank you to everybody that participated on the call. We know that we have important battles ahead. We also know just how important our campaign for people, health and the planet um, has to be to put, put people before profit and how essential international solidarity is. We must keep working together to insist there is no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics, including foreign policy, and to not only argue that a better world is possible, but win that better world. So just to let you know, we have um, more Arise Festival events coming up, um, an event on crisis, uh, the, the coronavirus, crisis and hostile environment with my good fellow on the 20th of May and that will be the start of our online online Arise Festival which will be going from May to July. Uh, please note that for today there are two more excellent online May Day events. Uh, one on what kind of economy we need which will be starting at 4.30 and uh, People's Assembly May Day special at 7pm. More details on both of those can be found on the May Day page 2020. Thank you very, very much again for being on the call. Uh, happy May Day and solidarity to all.